up, Internet? You're tuned in episode 78 of the Video Game Pals. I'm your host, Pete and Bessie, joined by the human equivalent of a thumbs-down emoji, Mr. Andy Brown. Wow. I like it, but I hate it. The same way I like you, but I hate you. That's that's what I want to hear from one of my oldest and dearest friends. The Lord with the heart of gold, Mr. Robert Thompson. I, I want a title like Andy's. That was awesome. <laughs> the human equivalent of the skeleton emoji, Mr. Robert Thompson. Fine, good enough. <laughs> Spooky, scary skeletons. <laughs> and the guildmaster himself, the human equivalent of the sun emoji, Mr. Sean Bartley. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Praise hello, the hello. sun. I'll take the first part. I don't know about the second part. <laughs> Because you light up this show, Sean, and my life. Wow. Holy <laughs> shit. Thank you. Turn that so around. we're going to kick this. Sh- <laughs> See, it's good. That was a good one. And you're a paladin. I feel like it all tracks. It all comes around there. Hey, get yeah. it? A paladin? Ooh. Oh, shit. Ooh. How have we never made that joke in 78 episodes of this show? <laughs> Andy put on his thinking brain. I see you. <laughs> ah. Very good. Uh. So as uh, as you guys might have guessed, we're going to kick the show off this week by talking about what we're playing, and uh, I have played a little bit of Red Dead Redemption 2! So we talked a lot about it last week. Um, I am not far enough in the game to, I think, give like full impressions yet, but um, my initial impressions are positive, even if they are limited. I'd say I'm, I'm still a good amount into, if you've read any coverage of the game, you're probably familiar at this point that the intro to the game is about six hours long. And I am probably about halfway through that now. And so far, I've been enjoying the characters. Um, I'm getting into the story quite a bit. It's like very bare bones, kind of just teaching me how to do all the stuff that you used to do in Red Dead 1. But here's how it works now. So I don't have too, too much to add, but um, I'm looking forward to playing it a, a bit more this week and uh, getting into it because... It's been pretty interesting. I think, like, review scores have been overwhelmingly positive. I picked a couple roundups here. Uh, we got 10s from Game Informer, IGN, Easy Allies, Push Square, 5 out of 5 from The Guardian, uh, 10 from Push Start, 9 from GameSpot, recommended by Eurogamer, and it has a, um, what is, a Metacritic score of 96 mm. right now based on 37 Jeez. reviews. So, you know, uh, I think expectedly, you know, the game was going to track well, I think, with critics, and, like, that's seems to be what it's doing but there's definitely been some hustle and bustle online of people complaining about some of like the choices in the game and i know andy wanted to talk about that a little bit yeah so i have not played the game at all um i mean i'll still probably pick it up because it's still probably a really good game but uh it's my understanding that they've made a bunch of choices in the name of immersion that like really don't sit well with me Like, they've slowed, again, have not played the game, tell me if I'm wrong, they've slowed a lot of stuff down, I know we were talking about, like, the looting, uh, or the, uh, the skinning of a horse, not a horse, Yeah, like, skinning, skinning animals in general was something I noticed was a lot slower, because they, like, made it a way more involved animation, and made it look very realistic, which is not necessary. (laughs) Yep, and, like, slowing down how long it takes to loot a body. So it's like, I, I... It's, it's weird, because I definitely noticed the thing with the skinning, but in terms of, like, actual moment-to-moment gameplay, I haven't really noticed that, and I was surprised to see so many people make that, like, complaint, you know, because, like, gunplay-wise, like, riding your horse, like, all those things are just about the same. I think the only thing I've noticed specifically that um, has been frustrating for me is some of their choices with, like... And I, I do think this is made in the, in the to your point in the um in the effort to not break immersion. They've made a couple like kind of like quick menu shortcuts that are the ways like the way you open your satchel, which is how you like eat food or take a tonic if you need to you know up your health or your dead eye meter or whatever, or if you need to like you know throw out some of the skins that you've had so you can pick up a new item or whatever. Like that's done by holding right on the D pad. Okay. Until the menu comes up, you know, instead of just like going to a pause menu and navigating and doing some of those things that are more kind of like muscle memory, they're very tried and true. And like, you expect them to work that way. So when you do like go for it, and you're like, oh, right, like, how do I do that again? Like, it has some of those little like, things that I don't think will be a problem 10 hours in 20 hours in. But right now, it's it was like when I picked up Breath of the Wild, and you're like, why is the jump button there? You know, <laughs> yeah. you get used to it. But 
those are things that I noticed that seemed like they were done in an effort to make it feel less like gamey, but were really just doing the opposite and reminding me that I was playing a game because I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I don't think that feeling gamey is such a bad thing either. Like, it's a game. No. Yep. Um, and like, Breath of the Wild is incredibly gamey, and that's like a big thing that works about it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's that's the thing is I. I see both sides. I see wanting to minimize, like, distractions, you know? Because, like, I think about God of War, and, like, it's very minimal HUD. And that's cool, because it doesn't distract you. But, like, Red Dead is a less linear game. It's open world. There are a lot of gamey things in it. And, I don't know. I, I think, like, it seems like they may, may have taken, might, excuse me, may have taken a few steps too far in they the effort They may have gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> they may have gone too far. Uh, so, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to be interested to see how I feel about it in, in, in another week when we check back in next week and I see, once I've gotten through the linear part of the game, how these things are affecting my moment-to-moment gameplay when I'm out in the field, you know? Yeah, for sure. I'm definitely interested to hear what you have to say about it. If I get around to this game, it probably won't be till like Christmas time. So, yeah, by then you should have a good idea yeah, of, of what of yeah you know, what I'm thinking about it. Yeah, and uh, you know, also this week, Thompson and I are going to be picking up the game over on Pal's Play. Uh, so normally we post that show Monday through Thursday, but because of when Red Dead came out and everything, and when our shoots usually fall in the week, uh, we decided to push our things back by a day. So we're going to be posting videos Tuesday to Friday this week well, on Red there's Dead. There's gonna Redemption. be a Pal's Play on a Friday. Yeah. I know, your mind's going to explode. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you guys want to check out Thompson's first impressions of the game, make sure you tune into Pals Play by then. And I'll probably have gotten a good amount more into the game by that point, and we'll be able to talk a little bit about it more. So if you can't wait until next week for our Red Dead thoughts, m- remember to go tune into Pals Play this week. And uh, we're also going to do our follow-up to last week's big story with, you know, Red Dead and Crunch and Jason Trier's additional stories come out. But I didn't want to have a week... Two weeks back to back of nothing but like talking around Red Dead. So I figured next week we'll do our big Red Dead episode and we'll also have our Castlevania season two review, which also came out this week, but came out about a day before we record. So, uh, we didn't have time to get through the entire season yet, but uh, well, so we'll have speak a- for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, Thompson's ready to go for you. So next week we got a we got a great show for you. So make sure you tune in for more Red Dead and Castlevania Two. Uh, but getting back to this week's show, which is also great, right? Yes. <laughs> no, trust me. There's a lot of really cool shit this yes. week, and that's why I was able to kick this can down the road. <laughs> but uh, Sean, you've got a small update for us uh, in Battle for Azeroth, right? Yeah. So real quick, last week I talked about how we were on the seventh boss of Old Deer. And uh, we killed him. We killed him in four pulls on Wednesday night, which was pretty cool. Uh, Everyone was very, very surprised by, you know, we walk in. Quick, right? Oh, my goodness. Um, Super fast, especially when you consider that three of those pulls probably ended within the first four minutes of an eight-minute fight, or rather a nine-minute fight. Um, So then we just killed him. You know, he just fell over. And that was really, really awesome. Uh, one of the most important things when you're working on the back half of a raid is that you kill all your farm content fast. Farm content just refers to the bosses that you can reliably kill quickly um, or have killed multiple times. Sometimes you get caught up on a boss for whatever reason, and that can eat up time. You know, like that can be a half hour here or even sometimes up to an hour, uh, which is really, really frustrating. But this week, we were able to kill all of our farm bosses on Tuesday, and that left us with all of Wednesday Jeez. to kill Mithrax, who was the seventh boss. Uh, but we didn't need that. We only needed for the four pulls, so now we are on Gahoon. Mythic Gahoon is uh, the last boss we've got to kill, and um, it's a doozy. It's definitely a doozy of a boss, but we are going to be extending, which essentially means that we save the lockout, so we can only fight the one boss that we have left. All the other bosses are dead, so we can't fight them anymore. Normally, it would reset so you could fight everything you've already fought, but in an effort to keep up with progression and just get this thing done with, we're just going to extend until the, the last boss dies. 
so didn't you do this with <clears throat> not the seventh boss, boss, but the sixth boss, where you guys like got knocked him down like really quickly, unexpectedly? Yeah. Uh, so we were working on the fifth boss for two weeks, and then we killed him and killed the seventh, the, the sixth boss, the very next day, Zool. We killed Zool uh, in like twenty something pulls. So now you got two weeks, in a row, <clears throat> two weeks in a row, right? Where you've had like just essentially like a boon, right? Like because the last time you had Dexter boss, this time you got him in four pulls. You got all your your farm things done. Yeah, I know you were talking about like extending a while back, but like when the ranks or whatever, and like the one group decided to do it, which is like essentially what got them. So like we talking about like doing the farm things. It gives you the item, so you get better to do the extending, basically. So yeah, like. There, there's always that conversation when you get to this point in the raid, which is very frustrating for me as a raid leader. And the conversation is, do we extend just to get it over with, or do we reset the lockout so that we can farm and kill bosses for more loot? Just like you just like you said. And um, in my opinion, most of the time, it's better to just extend because... You can't guarantee, like, we can't just say, all right, well, we killed Mithrax once, it'll go down really fast again next time. Mm, That's not right. a, a sure thing. Uh, yeah. So you don't want to take that risk most of the time. And then also, I like to get people in the mentality of this is the boss we are doing. You know, if if I could extend sure. on every single boss, I would, but that's ridiculous because you would never get more gear, and you need that. <laughs> um but if I could, I would, because I just want to focus on the one boss. I don't even like to think about other bosses, other than the one that we are progressing on. So that's that's where that comes from. No, it's awesome. And it makes sense when you, like what you pointed out before, that like if you get caught up on one of those other bosses and you're wasting that time, like you're going to fall behind yep. in the ranking. So thank you for saying that, because that reminds me, um, we are trying to be in the top 100 uh, alliance guilds in the world. Because when you do that, if you're top 100 alliance or horde, there's a very special uh, title that your guild gets called uh, Famed Slayer. And only 100 guilds will get it from either side. And we're trying for that. Right now, we're 103, but only... <gasps> what? Yeah. But but since Gahoon isn't dead yet, only 38... Alliance guilds have killed the boss, so that there's that those what what is that sixty two spots right. um, that are that are left, and we're trying to sneak into that. Wait, so why are you here doing this podcast and not <laughs> right there <laughs> killing Gahoon right now? I hear you, man. I wish we could. I wish we could, but uh, unfortunately, we're a guild that really only has the nine hours a week, and we can't push past that because we, you know, so many of us just have lives that take up time, you know. You have lives outside of WoW? Weird. Very weird. <laughs> How are you going to get to the top 100 like that? These people need to quit their jobs and dedicate <laughs> themselves to the guild. Well, if somebody wants to sponsor us, uh, <laughs> hey. Us. We have like, an angel investor. <laughs> I don't see you raiding with me. You should raid with whoa, me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm management. I'm going to manage I'm managing management. Them. <laughs> you probably stand in fire. Get out of here. What? <laughs> you top well, beyond the flame. We don't do that. <laughs> you're not in my guild. You're not. You're not beyond the flames. That's what I'm saying. But like you know, team effort building. You know what I mean. You know, like I've said, management for you. You know, so you can tell them what to do. Like I'll take all the nitty gritty and the donations. I'll make it work. I'll make the investments. You know, I'm good at money. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Thompson wants to just be like the foreman. You know, he yeah. doesn't participate at all, but he stands behind you with a clipboard and just nods a lot. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I'll tell you guys how great you do, and, and I'll yeah, strategize. Yeah, we'll, we'll get on money. your your Discord server. You can be like, hey, we have some guys from corporate here today. They're just here to oversee. <laughs> yeah, <that'd be> great. <laughs> <laughs> there are guilds that have that. They're they're oh, oh, yeah. they really don't doubt it. Method and them have that. Like they're businesses. They have like a coach, yeah. Jesus oh Christ. sure, absolutely. They have pe- they yeah. have people who literally all their job is is to farm um like materials for like potions and things like that. That's all they do. And then they have other people who are just like coaches and then they have people who are fucking um they make uh what's the word I'm looking for? Mod- mods. They make mods. So like if they get on a boss where they're like, "Hmm, we need a specific kind of Aware awareness for this, like we need the we need it to tell me when we're standing too close to each other. There's someone who's gonna make a mod that will do that. That's insane. Yeah, it's nuts. That's someday we'll get you that kind of uh, 
infrastructure. Oh, that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I wish. See, Andy's thinking you, you can be the. We gotta start president. selling merch, Sean. We gotta get the Beyond the Flames T-shirts, <laughs> the hoodies, the sweatbands. <laughs> What's a sweatband? You know, like uh, like what LeBron oh, James oh, wears yes. to like hide the fact that he's bald. Yes. yes. <laughs> Absolutely. The question is if we can get LeBron James to start wearing one of the Beyond the Flames headbands. That's what we know we really take it off. That's right. not a question. We can do it. Sadly, I'm going to go with a no just because he's in L.A. now and it doesn't mesh with the colors. It's, you know, it would clash. Fair. Yeah. What's, what's the uh, Beyond the Flames color scheme? Let's see what basketball players we can get in this headband. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like a red, red orange, you know, type okay. thing. Yeah. Oh, so we just like got to get, like, whoever's left on the Cleveland Cavs. Tristan Thompson. <laughs> I heard he's, you know, he's looking around. It's a good name. Good good last name there. I can rely on that person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. All right, so move right along. Uh, and you also had some stuff to talk about this week, which uh, you have been playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey on Google's Project Stream. Yeah. Yeah, I got into the beta for Project Stream a couple weeks ago, so I have Assassin's... It's insane! You always get into, like, every beta! Yeah, what's up with that? Um, honestly, it's because I get into every beta. Like, most of the beta applications are like, have you ever done a beta test before? I'm like, uh... yeah, I did all these. And I never got sued! Yeah. <laughs> um, but, like, the technology is fucking insane. I just run Assassin's Creed Odyssey in a Google Chrome tab like it's nothing. And, like, as long as I'm not doing anything else with my internet, like, if I'm not trying to play Netflix in the background or whatever, it runs at, like, I have a, a 1080p screen on my laptop. It runs at 1080p and, Whoa. like, uh, keeps a stable 30 and there's minimal wow. input lag. Yeah. That was going to be my question was how's the frame rate? But if it's yep. locked at 30, like yeah, that's it, not bad it, for what it, what you're talking it about. It stays stable um, like every once in a while if there's a hiccup in my connection, it'll like it blur out for a couple seconds. Or if my computer's trying to do something else in the background, it'll slow down and get worse. But like as long as I'm set up right, it works flawlessly. That's insane. <laughs> yep. And I've, I've heard that, but like. You know, I, I kind of take it with a grain of salt when I'm hearing it from somebody who's, like, an industry professional because I'm assuming that they have a decent rig and a pretty good internet connection because they make their money off being on the internet. Like, I'm assuming that, like, well, with the right caveats, but, like, knowing your setup, yep. like, you're in general DC internet connection, which is, like, moderate, yeah, but it's but not, like, excellent. I When I moved here, I signed up for 100 megabit because I thought I like speed, and it was... At the time, maybe a mistake, because, like, I don't need that much speed, but now I do, and I don't regret it at all. Yeah, it's like, that's that's really cool, man. So, wow, that's really fascinating. Okay, so does the game traditionally run at 60, or is 30 the standard I think, across? I think the game runs at 30, but I'm not sure if it's locked on, like, PCs where you, or, like, the traditional PC, like, go in and mess around with the settings. Yeah. It, pro- it probably runs at 60 on, like, a PS4 Pro or an Xbox One X, but I would imagine on, like, the base PS4 Xbox unit, you're probably locked at 30. Wow. Yeah. That's really impressive, then. That's that's really cool. Um, I'm, I know we, we've talked about this idea on the show uh, several times, and I still am weary of the concept of, um, you know, if my internet gets weird, then I'm screwed. You know, I already deal with that in WoW and HOTS, I, you know. Um, but the fact that it's, that it works that way, you know, for someone who, who, who can, who has some sort of reliable internet and maybe doesn't have the capacity to just buy new games like that or whatever, that's pretty cool. Do you know how much it would, like, you're in the beta, do you know how much it would cost to play the game through that? They haven't talked about price They haven't yet, talked right? about, like, a price setup at all, no. But I imagine they do it like a Steam storefront. Where it's just like you can just buy the game and have it attached to your account rather than a like a Netflix kind of thing. Ooh. Who knows though, yeah. man? It could, it could it could seriously go either way at this point. Yeah, honestly, like, this has just made me more excited to see Microsoft's take on this because like their cloud yeah. is better than Google's right, right now. Sure. Yeah, it's just like it's interesting because like I feel like Microsoft. I'm more interested in like what Microsoft has to do inherently because of their experience in the space the infrastructure they already have in place like they already have the xbox controller and all that stuff but it's like 
if anybody can give them a run for their money, it's Google. True. Like, yeah. They've got they've got a ton of money to burn setting up infrastructure if they, if they really think this is something that they like want to get in on. Like this could this could be their way in. And we we talked you know weeks ago or months ago at this point about how they were meeting people at E three and everything like that, and they had been expressing interest in like a console or something. You know, maybe this is that thing. And like, I don't know, man. It's it's really interesting. I think the the money point is evident in the fact that this beta launched like five days after Assassin's Creed Odyssey came out and they're just like giving you the game to play until January. Wow. That's insane, right? Wow. The, you're getting this game for free, yep. basically. Um, so speaking of the game, because like I think the takeaway here is that Project Stream is really impressive and you're liking it, right? Yeah. Um, what are you thinking about Assassin's Creed? I love, it's my game of the year right now. Wow, really? Yeah. See, I've heard so many people throw that out there, and I'm just like, ah, like, how could it be? But hearing you say that carries a lot of weight for me, knowing that you don't love open world games, and you have no attachment to Assassin's Creed. It's got so much Metal Gear Solid Five in its blood, and, like, I love that game. Mm. Huh. Uh, I might like it then. Like, open world stealth games are awesome. Like, you see, uh, like, a Spartan or Athenian fort in the distance, you're like, you know what? I bet I could fuck those guys up. And you get your little eagle to scout everybody out for you. And then you sneak up and you can, you know, stealth kill people until everything goes south. And then it turns into an action game. And that's great. Um, they have the, the Sparta kick power from 300. <laughs> so if you, like, there have been several difficult fights where, uh, like... A higher level person's coming after me. It's like, fuck, I don't know what to do. So I get oriented where their back's to a cliff, and then I kick them in the chest, and they go flying off the cliff and die. That's, That's fucking good. awesome. Yep. So I'm I'm so surprised that you say that this is your game of the year when I know that you played and lost interest in Tomb Raider. Yeah. I, oh. Wow. Yeah. Tomb oh. Raider. I, like, I liked Tomb Raider. It just... I don't know. Do you think you'll circle back to it at some point? Probably. Yeah. Like, Tomb Raider was one of those games where I didn't put it down on purpose, but then I just didn't pick it back up when I had time again. Yeah, that happened to me with God of War. It's like, you know, I totally get that it happens, but it speaks volumes about how you're feeling about this game, yeah. that it's kept you engaged. Yeah, I'm maybe, like, 12, 13 hours in. It's, like, it's still definitely that, like, Assassin's Creed Ancient Aliens nonsense, <laughs> but but it's fun. <laughs> um, uh, what are you thinking about the story? The story is, like, it's trying to tell six different stories at once. It's not great. Mm. Are you... Did you pick the Cassandra? Or? Yeah, I picked Cassandra. She's yeah. a terrifying psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, I'm into that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, she also looks like Wonder Woman, so that's pretty cool. Yep. <laughs> you know, so, like, so what are you thinking about the story? So, the story is the same, like, Assassin's Creed, Ancient Aliens nonsense, slash just, like romp around history with the famous people of the time and it's it's trying to tell like five or six different stories which is kind of messy because it's an open world game with a bunch of plot threads so like Mm. uh this happens i think it takes place like 400 years before origins and that game ended with them founding the assassin's order so there's so this is pre-assassin this is pre-assassins um uh cassandra the uh, main or my main character at least pointedly says in like the first mission i'm not an assassin (laughs) (laughs) all right because like somebody's asking you to just like solve a problem by killing some dudes for them it's like well i guess i'll do it because i'm a mercenary (laughs) mercenaries creed oh my god the game we all wanted (laughs) yeah but like so there's like this family drama happening and then also there's this cult that I think is, like, the precursors to the Templars that, like, want to control everything. And they've, like, kidnapped and threatened the Oracle at Delphi. So she, like, whenever somebody comes asking about politics, she tells them what the cult wants them to tell her. Or to tell mm. them. And, like, so I'm hanging out with Herodotus right now, which is just like, oh, okay. And he's like, we gotta go ever. talk to Pericles. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I might have to play this game just to have chats, like, chill chats with Herodotus. Like, that's probably, like, the biggest selling point you've said yet for me. 
I mean, honestly, the big selling point for me is like Andy saying it's his game of the year means that I I heavily think that this will probably end up being my Final Fantasy 15 of 2018, where it'll be the game I get around Christmas where I'm like, this cannot be a game of the year contender for me because I played it too late, but I sure enjoyed it. So I don't know. Maybe I'll look for it on sale. Yeah. You're definitely selling me on it a little bit here because I was already on the fence. Like, it sounds good. It's a lot of fun. Um... If you liked Black Flag, the, like, excellent naval combat is still there, so you can just, like, sail around Greece yes! on your boat, and Ugh. you don't have to be a pirate, you can just, like, fight other boats, but, like, Greece was kind of a naval state because it's an archipelago, so you gotta have a boat. Boat fights. They're fun. This, That's what, it's like the best thing in Black Flag. Disqualified yeah. from Game of But the it's year. the awesome naval combat of old where you just walked on the other person's ship and fought them there with swords and shields and shit. You know what I mean? I mean, you can do that. Like, the idea back then was let's have a land battle on water. It, it is like, both. You have to fuck up their ship until you can board them and then you board them and have to, like, kill the survivors. <laughs> and then the ship sinks and you can loot everything. So... What kind of boat do you actually use? Is it a trireme? Do you know boats? Andy? I don't know boats at all. Okay. Um, it's a boat. Never mind. <laughs> it has a big sail, and sometimes I tell them to put the sail down to move faster, and sometimes I tell them to put the sail up and just row so we can be in combat. You can row? Thompson, oh, fuck yes. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, Thompson, I'm pretty sure that the, I think they're the, the they're the like Athenian-style boats, the real big sail yeah, ships yeah. that also have the rowing like right. holes right, right, right. on the side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the amount of rows is like how many things? So trireme, three rows, right? Like, two, like bireme would be like a quadrant, you know. So how many rows of orbs you have is, is the thing for them? Okay. Oh yeah. God, I yeah. Have no it's idea. it's one of those it's one of those ships. Like I'm I'm yeah. Because yeah. I'm not an expert no, on no, ancient no, no, no. cool. Greek. But, uh, but my God, history, that's like really cool. Guys, I want to use one of those. I, know, boats. I, I swear to God, I I can't do this show. We are talking about ships. I, 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 I'm out. I'm just done. I thought it was just pirates. I, I think boats are fucking cool as hell, but I, I don't know. No. Sean hates boats. He's from the city. I hate boats, too. Yeah. One time, listen, listen. One time I was forced to be on a boat, okay? And Pete knows what I'm talking about. And I was forced to be on a boat with some people that I liked, but didn't really want to be on a boat with. And there was drinking on this boat, and it was just circling around. In, uh, in New York, and it was one of the worst experiences of my life. Why? Because it's awkward as hell, because you're trapped, because if anyone on the <laughs> boat is crazy, you're probably just dead, and uh, I don't know how you to swim. throw them off. No. They have a gun. What if they yeah. have a gun? I don't disagree with all of those points. I just think warships of the water are fucking rad as hell, because... Because they're Sean, really cool. I'm telling you. Because they're a testament to man's arrogance. You know what I mean? They really are. Like, <laughs> you know, let's fly. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, that kind of shit. Boats, like, let's let's put the 80,000 tons in the water and have it float. That's that's crazy. Boats are awesome. I'm telling you. Boats you got to just experience the high seas, bro. You know what else is a testament to man's arrogance? That you guys think that anybody gives a shit about this. No one cares <laughs> about boats. Uh, Thompson, I've done yeah. my research. The boat is a bireme. Th- thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Two layers. And oh. I just want to leave you guys with one last story about why I'm enjoying Assassin's Creed so much. It does involve both Sean, so you can check out if you want to. Okay. <laughs> so uh, there's also like a Shadow of Mordor like mercenary system where if you do bad things, bounty hunters will come after you and they'll track you down and try and kill you. So I like sailed into this big naval battle between Sparta and Athens and I'm fighting, and it's like, okay, I'm taking out the ships, and then all of a sudden, this fucking mercenary out of nowhere shows up on a giant ship, and it's like, I don't give a shit about the politics or the war that's happening. I'm just here to kill you. Nice. Yeah, that's really <laughs> terrifying. Like, the nemesis system would go really well in this, but it, yeah, I could see mercenaries working for it. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. It's it's a real good game. I would recommend it if you want to wait for a sale. That also probably wouldn't be a bad idea because you got enough on your plates right now. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a game I'm I'm gonna keep an eye out for on Black Friday. I think. 
So uh, if you guys want to let us know what you're playing this week, hit us with a random question or just say hey. Uh, remember, you can hit us up in the comments down below uh, or shoot us an email over at thevideogamepals at gmail.com. Follow our sister show at the Comics Pals wherever your social media is sold. And uh, whatever your favorite way of those to get in touch with us, you know, we'll see it. And uh, we'll uh, we'll read your thoughts on the air if you're, uh, you know, nice or at least funny. Or we think we can dunk on you. That's always fun, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you, <laughs> if you want to help the show out, uh, remember you can give us a like on your platform of choice. Bounce over to Apple Podcasts and give us one of those sweet reviews. If you're a YouTube person, you can give the video a like. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Click that notification bell so that you know when our daily videos go live on the YouTube channel of the Video Game Pals. And uh, last but not least, share it. You know, if you're enjoying what we're doing here, just uh, let your pals out there know that we do. Uh, we put on a pretty good show. And that you think they might enjoy it as well. The news, the news, we talking about the news, the news, the news, we talking about the news. All right, so we've got a pretty packed news list this week. Uh, definitely enough to keep us busy, busy until Red Dead uh, kicks us around next week. But uh, so kicking things off right, the internet was a buzz this week with a seemingly legitimate leak of the Smash Bros. Ultimate Final Launch roster. So did you guys get a chance to see this? No. Yes. So. Really, Sean? I don't want to see. I don't want to see crap like this. You know why? <laughs> because if it's fake but it's good, then I'm gonna want it, and then it's not gonna happen. If it's fake and it's bad, then I'm gonna look at it and I'm gonna be annoyed that it's bad. But if it's real and it's bad, then that's the worst possible scenario. So none of those work for me. I don't want to know. I want Nintendo to hey, tell me the roster. But you're, what if it's real and it's good? You yeah, left out that option. completely leaving out that option. You know why? Because ultimately, when the game releases, if it's bad, like if I dislike the characters that, that are you know left to release, at least it's official. It's the official announcement. It is what it is. I'm hyped. But if it's a leak, I have to ruminate on it and whether it's real or not, and then I'll, I'll be hit with reality later. I don't want that. I just want them to tell me what it is. <laughs> I actually hate leaks. I really don't like leaks. <laughs> but whatever. Talk about it. All right. Let's talk about it. So uh, the story originally broke on Reddit, uh, but I'm going to just read the IGN article by one Mr. Je or maybe Miss, actually. It's by Jesse Wade. That's what we're going to say. Um... Just because there's a couple, like, angles to it that they, uh, they cleaned up pretty nicely. So, uh, an alleged leak for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate's roster appeared online Wednesday, and Nintendo fans have been completing hours of research to uncover details behind the leak. After being posted to Snapchat in a video by an unnamed French person at the time, it was originally deleted and then appeared as a pasted-together image on Discord and later 4chan. The images have been circulating the internet and can now be seen on Imgur. So, uh, we've got a link to him down below if you want to check it out, but essentially there is a, uh, basically like kind of a wrapped graphic that shows the, you know, full Smash roster that we've seen multiple times and they keep adding the new characters in with some notable additions. Uh, so, moving right along, Leak Review took to Twitter to explain the exhaustive, exhaustive lengths that fans have gone through to put together the missing pieces in the puzzle, including who the person is behind the images and which characters could be where in the pixelated mashup. The user's name was scribbled out, but still possibly legible to an extent, and is rumored to be a person who, according to their LinkedIn page, went to school for graphic design and works for Mariana PLV, a company who prints out promotional materials for companies. A user by the name of Euclis on Game FAQs carefully translated the person's LinkedIn page as it is entirely in French. The title reads out Reasonable Grands. It basically means account manager at Mariana Workshops, right? So they're laying out the case of why this makes sense. So then, uh, moving along to the Reddit thread that we were talking about, um, there's also. Uh, a, an, another little detail that was from a unofficial French Nintendo news profile that um, said that the person who was, you know, rumored to be connected or whatever is working with Nintendo as a graphic designer on Smash. Uh, so it's the translated tweet says Nintendo News was able to check with the company concerned that the employee behind the alleged leak of Smash Bros. Ultimate uh, works well for this one. So obviously a little bit of a weird translation there. But um, it, so the, all this leads up to the thing that this looks like it could be. A legitimate leak and you know that points to a couple interesting developments on the character front 
right? Which uh, the the characters who we saw in the outline were um, Shadow from Sonic the Hedgehog, Banjo Kazooie, Ken from Street Fighter, Isaac from Golden Sun, Mock Rider from Mock Rider on the NES, Gino from uh, Super Mario RPG, and the Chorus Kids. So this is um this is interesting because I think these characters are definitely ones that have been rumored for a long time. They some of them have been requested for a very long time, and given the context of Ultimate being you know very much kind of like checking fans' wish list boxes. Except uh, Waluigi. Waluigi. Hey, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, oh. uh, yeah. But but that that being said, I I'm interested in this because it, you know, I'm I'm also not usually one to take leaks too seriously un- unless they seem like there's a lot of supporting information and you take a look at this reddit thread and how many edits have been made and how how much research has been done into trying to like put it all together and it it seems like it might be legitimate um then there was one last update on the uh the ign story where uh the employee who is apparently behind the link said that they don't have anything to do with the situation so you know uh with, with all this, you're going to have to just take it with a grain of salt, obviously, like we do with any leak. But what do you guys think about the veracity of this? And if it is true, what do you think about this list of characters? Sean, why don't you start? Sure, man. Um, do I think it's real? No, I don't. But that okay. being said, um, what do I think of the characters? I have no clue who the chorus kids are. They're from um, they're from, uh, Rhythm Heaven for the DS, I think. Rhythm Heaven, yeah, yeah. It, it's like a it's like a, th- a DS or 3DS series that is like real popular in Japan, and they've been like on that like I've seen them rumored a lot oh, through this release cycle. You know, okay. a lot of people have been they're weird the little gremlins. Really the cut. Then that that's fine. You know, um, Ken. I, I really don't see Ken making the cut. I, I just, that's a real big surprise. Um, I, it, like, is he an echo? I mean, obviously we don't know those things, but, um, I, the only reason I feel like it might not be is just because of Richter. Like fucking Richter Belmont is in the game. You tell me Ken doesn't have more recognition than him. No, you know, it sure like, does. Ah. It's just, it's like Castlevania time, right? Like, yeah. Street Fighter's not really in. The, like no one's really talking about Street Fighter, but that that being yeah. said, Ryu's in, so Ken and Ryu, you know, they go together. Uh, Shadow, yeah, Shadow, I just don't buy that. I just I don't. I would love it because Shadow's cool and everything, but I don't believe that he's in this game. The uh, with him, he's another one where I feel like I would agree with you if there weren't evidence that made me think it might be possible. Because it's the same thing with Isabel. Remember when we're like, oh, we didn't see her as an assist trophy, and then they announced her as a character. When they showed off the uh, the batch of assist trophies, we got Knuckles instead of Shadow. And he's been an assist trophy for like three games? It's a fair point. Or two games, I guess. It's a fair point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I believe it just because of the, the trends this roster has been taking. Like the... Let's just, you know, everything people wouldn't shut up about that they wanted in Brawl. <laughs> Except Waluigi. <laughs> yeah, but nobody wanted Waluigi, Waluigi yeah. until he wasn't in this that's one. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very recent development. <laughs> yeah, but this is all, like, the things people were like, yeah, Brawl on the Nintendo Wii better have Ridley and King K. Rule and Geno because, like, Super Mario RPG is still relevant in 2018. Hey, amazing game. But as much people as I love do Gino, really fucking want Gino. No, I know it doesn't he's make my sense. One. He's my number one out of this list of everyone else. I don't give a shit about half of these characters, but like I, I don't care if Gino not give a shit about Isaac. Golden Sun was so good. I, you know, honestly, I, I never played Golden Sun because like I don't really associate. Like I've played Golden Sun a shitload when I was younger, but like I never really associated Isaac. You know, like like this is a, a character from. It's just like it was a game I played. You know. It's kind of mm, like, for me, sure. it's like asteroids. Like, I'm the triangle shooting the rocks. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I didn't think about the guy or whatever I was playing. Cause, I triangle know. ship for Smash confirmed. Hey, asteroid ship? That There's there's merit. You could drop meteors like Thanos, you know, on people. That'd be cool. Um, yeah, but like, Gino, definitely my number one pick here. Like, I am surprised there's such love for it, um, for him in particular. Like, he's... he's 
I just, I don't, I just hope like they don't like, you know, you said that they are kind of like, oh, here, everyone that's been bitching about anything, just give it to them. I just hope that a lot of these characters, I don't think this is going to be too much of a problem, but that they don't have like too similar, you know, like we had to shove out 12 characters and they're like, oh, 10 more, you know, these lists are getting, obviously everyone's here, right? Getting pretty big, but I hope that it doesn't detract from the overall new characters having like unique play styles or anything that kind of like treads on themselves. Cause I know like fighting games are better sometimes when they're smaller, you know? Yeah. Brawl's not like tiny by any measure, but adding like a bunch of people, if they've, if they've thought it out, I'm sure they did, you know, but that's a concern. Yeah. I, I think that they're, what were there? Five, six characters in the league. Um, yeah. I think it's, I think so it's something six, like that. Six. Yeah. Six. And like, I'm almost definitely sure that shadow and Ken, at the very least, are going to be echoes. Yeah, see, the echo thing is really smart when you are trying to show a bunch of characters in that you are like, like, you know, yeah. I, I would have liked you know certain things to not be echoes, but that's cool. Like, you know, at least you get to play them. You know, skins for wins. You know, it's good times. And Andy is definitely swaying me when you say that all these characters were characters that people ranted about in Brawl. You're one thousand percent right. So that makes me feel like, all right, maybe they were listening to feedback, and and these are the characters that they put in based on that. Um, that's that's entirely possible, man. I'm just gonna put my hands up and say, we'll see. I think uh, just one last point on that, and then we can move on. Is that I think the other characters that aren't the heavily requested ones have logic internally as well. Like the mock rider, they always put one weird obscure character that nobody remembers or mm. like has thought of in the games. Like since Game and Watch, that would make sense for that. Um, Chorus Kids is a super Japanese friendly pick, and then uh, Banjo was one of the number one third party requests. Like every time they put the vote out, and he just hasn't won yet. But all the people above him have now, so it's like total. I I feel like Banjo being in the game like totally makes sense too. No crash. Yeah, I don't know. I hope. I hope this is real. I. I would also really like crash, but he could be DLC. We can still get him. You're right. Ah, uh, yes. Get him. Because when all these games came out, you thought in 1998 someday I'll be able to make Crash Bandicoot, Sonic the Hedgehog, Solid Snake, and Cloud Strife fight each other on a Nintendo console. Hey, not to you know, not to say <laughs> it was the Nintendo console, but my mind went there with all the video game characters fighting each other. You know, I. Why not? You know, anything can fucking happen. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right, Thompson. Why not? Like at this point, once they put Cloud Strife in Smash, any character is up for grabs. Period. Yeah, I felt like that was so, Snake. That was insane. Yeah, that's from, true that too. was that was definitely mine. As soon as it, yes, there's no way Snake's gonna be what Snake. <laughs> at least, at least, like Metal Gear has been on an like Cloud has never ever been on a piece of Nintendo hardware ever, and he's in the game. So fucking a. But you're right. Like, I feel like Snake working proved that it didn't matter, you know, that, like, anybody can fit in Smash. It's just, you know, they just got to put the care in, yeah, and like they always Pac-Man. do. Even so you, I always Pete. forget Pac-Man's in Smash. What was that, Sean? I said, even you, Pete, you could work in Smash. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I would love to be on the Smash roster. Let's get me in there. Random question <laughs> of the week. Build Pete's moveset in Smash. <laughs> I just have that uh, that megaphone that Kirby has, where he just like yells really loudly. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, random fighter of the week. <laughs> I was gonna say Pete's down B would definitely be the uh, the like the speaker from Mario Kart, where it just like makes a big sound wave around. <laughs> wow, <him>. I like that. <laughs> All of my attacks are sound based. <laughs> yes, well, you could have like a like a journalistic sit down attack where like you sleep attack someone, you know, like you like put a microphone in their face, ask them questions, and they knock out. <laughs> or it could be like uh, what was it, MVC three with the uh, with uh, what, what's his name, Phoenix Wright, yeah, and he has some briefs where he's like throwing paper. <laughs> like... I mean, litigation. <laughs> I think all of your your A moves would have to be like drums related, though. Just like get get sticks out. Yeah, yeah, that's really. That's funny. Like the A, the A, like like a Kirby style attack. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm into it. Uh, so speaking of fighting game rosters, Two B from Near Automata is coming to Soul Calibur Six. 
Uh, cool. So the reveal trailer has showed off Tubi's move set, which fans have pointed out pulls heavily from Nier. Um, and I- I've got a quote from the Destructoid article because I don't know shit about Nier. Um, she will once again have Kane's outfit as an alternative costume, along with several items for the Create a Soul feature, including Emil's head. The city ruins will act as her stage and will have music from Nier Automata. So if you're a Nier fan, that's uh, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, obviously Nier was a really big game when it dropped, but it getting, you know, kind of, you know, um, celebrated again here in this way is pretty cool. Like, that's that seems like a pretty big achievement for Nier. Um, but I, I thought this was interesting just because now we, we're getting a better idea of what the additional characters in this game are going to look like, right? And I, I think especially given how kind of crazy Tekken 7's roster has has proved to be. Uh, it had me thinking about a little random question of the week. All right. Okay. So yeah. yeah, based on Tekken Seven's nutty ass roster and the fact that this game already has two iconic video game fighters added to its roster, who do you guys think we might see come to Soul Calibur Six? Hmm. I mean, can't you make like literally anybody in Soul Calibur now? Anyways, you could yes, the well, they're creating a character. Much, <laughs> it's it's always been phenomenal to you know to just get on that and make like a shitload of stupid characters day one when you get the game. <sighs> Man, I don't know. Uh, I'm really trying to think of like who else makes sense. You know, well they've had some interesting picks. This won't happen, but I really would have loved to have seen the Ninja Turtles available in this game. I think it makes a lot of sense. That'd be cool. I'd be into it. Yeah, I think I think they'd be a good pick, like, better than Tekken, because, like, I totally... You know, I, Tekken's got, I think, like, more mainstream appeal, but, like, their fighting style, I think, I think meshes better with Soul Calibur. Well, they ended up in Injustice. Oh, right! Fuck! Yeah, no. So who's in Tekken? It was Negan and... Akuma. Akuma, right, okay. Is that it? And Geese Howard. Right, okay. Okay, okay. So, like, I'm trying to think, who's another, like, good swordsman-type character who hasn't been checked off somewhere else? Hmm. Hmm. Well, you, like you said, you got Cloud, so now... <laughs> <laughs> That's not terrible. I mean, you could you could pull, like, any Final Fantasy character, you know, like, that... Half of them have swords, you know. Give me Gladio. <laughs> Honestly, they, they've, he's fucking Noctis awesome. Noctis was in a fighting game, right? Yeah, uh, wasn't he, in, he was in a Dissident of Final Fantasy, I think. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, if we're counting yeah, like well, the Final Fantasy yeah. fighting game, I mean, that that's... Yeah, yeah, right. Everyone's there. I don't know, I feel, like, I feel like Noctis could make sense. I mean, he teleports around mm. and stuff, so like, I don't know. Okay. Depends. I wish... I got it. I wish we could have console exclusives again because i want to see kratos yeah that would be awesome that was that was, that was what you were gonna say literally what i was gonna say is like kratos would be cool honestly uh uh what's the girl's name from horizon uh i thought she would be oh really aloy fun. yeah that would be good too yeah yeah and then if we bring back version exclusives we could put breath of the wild link <laughs> nah i'm good i don't if need to bring it all link. the way back we can bring yoda and vader uh, yeah, except you know. Now was, you're just naming old characters. I I really hated <laughs> fighting Yoda because he was annoying to fight. That's for sure. Oh my god, he had that forward uh, triangle move where he would just like like lunge to your chest with the saber, and I oh god, I screamed from that one move. <laughs> it's been a long time since I played a Soul Calibur game. I should go back to that. Me too, man. Yeah, I don't know. I'm interested in this one. I don't. I don't think I'll pick it up, but I know uh, a friend of ours already has it, so I'm hoping I can uh, spend some time with it. But uh, all right, so that that sounds good. Those are good picks. Let us know who you'd want to see added to the roster, um, and you can you know give us a crazy weird pick if you want. Uh, so moving right along, we've got a PlayStation Rock Block up next, uh, which you know we're gonna get through these pretty quick. But um, there, there's some interesting news here. So the the we already touched on a couple weeks ago about how name changes were finally going to be coming to the PlayStation Network, um, but we also discussed how there were a bunch of caveats to the fact that it was going to be coming. Well, it appears that uh, it's even worse than we discussed last time. <laughs> so um, <laughs> no way. 
Yeah, no, it's somehow worse. So I'm going to pull from Austin Goslin's article uh, over at Polygon because he did a great little wrap up here. But uh, all right, so let's jump into it. So um, PSN ID changes are finally on the way for PlayStation 4 users, but it looks like the process might not be as painless as we hoped. According to several Reset Era users who have received invitations to the PlayStation Preview Program System Software 6.10 Preview, a whole list of warnings accompanies the company's name change feature. One testing email, which appears to have only gone out to PlayStation customers in the United Kingdom thus far, was posted on a forum by user Abandoned Trolley. The initial message confirms that the upcoming patch 6.10 will include the change to ch- the chance to change PSN IDs. However, a follow-up post on the same thread from user Asduone. I'm going to go with that. Asduone <laughs> quotes the numerous caveats that the change comes with. Uh, so. Let's just uh, – they, they've got a screenshot of it. I'm just going to read read from their poll from the message. It hits all the, the big highlights. Uh, the message starts by warning players, quote, not all games and applications for the PS4, PS3, PS Vita, and other PlayStation systems support the online ID change feature. The warning c- continues by listing the possible consequences of changing your ID. So strap in, boys and girls. You may lose access to content, including paid-for content, that you have acquired for your games, including content like add-ons and virtual currency. You may lose progress within games, including game save data, leaderboard data, and progress toward trophies. Parts of your games and applications may not function properly, both online and offline. Your previous online ID may remain visible to you and other players in some places. Uh, and then it also throws in the, uh, there's like the details that are specific to the preview version, um, which first change is free for all users. Second one is, um, well, it's in euros or pounds, but it's nine bucks or eight bucks depending on, uh, but if you're a PS plus subscriber, you get the 50% discount. Uh, once you do change it or no, I'm sorry. If your previous online ID violates any of the terms of services, you won't be able to revert back to it like any of the other ones. So if you like snuck in like a dirty one underneath the radar, like, and you switch it, you might not be able to go back to it. Um, you can revert to your previous online ID once during the preview period. And then sub accounts can't change their online ID. So if you've got like a kid or something who's got a sub account for you, they're not going to be able to change theirs. And then after you change your online ID, it may take a few hours for it to reflect the new ID change. Uh, and then just the last thing was they got a, um, a Sony rep reached out to Polygon with a update who said, as noted in our announcement, this feature is compatible with PS4 games originally published after April 1st, 2018, and a large majority of the most played PS4 games that were released before this date. While there is a possibility that select games may encounter issues when changes are made to a user's online ID, we expect this to be a small amount of games that are affected. So, what do we think about this, boys? (laughs) Why? Why is it so bad? (laughs) I, I like how it feels like a a testament to someone's willpower to persevere. They're like, you know what? You really want to change your name? Here's all these problems, and who, who's gonna take this? You know what I mean? Like they're gonna they're gonna whittle out all the people who really aren't serious about changing their name, knowing this list of concerns. You might lose your currency. You might lose your saved data. You might lose content you already bought. What the fuck? I mean, it's your name. What the hell? Trophies? Like, how are you going to lose trophies? I don't even see how that makes sense. Some of this, Uh. just like I said, felt like they're adding more layers to the gauntlet to just, you know, make it harder almost. I genuinely want to know what the fuck is going on in their, like, name architecture that is making this so poorly, like, implemented. Well... I, I really I really think it must be the fact that it was built on the bones of the PS3 and PS Vita system, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I think that they probably never intended for us to be able to do that. And the system was made in such a way that your name is tied into everything else. And that changing that could have a very negative impact on your data. That makes sense to me. I just wish that they wouldn't, they just then wouldn't offer it at all. Because I'm not trying to go through the minefield just to change my name. Like, my my PS uh, N ID or whatever has, uh, like, no, normally I go with specific numbers in a specific order and they're flipped by mistake. And I can't, I've never uh. been able to swap them. 
And uh, so I was like, oh, cool, maybe I'll just swap them. Now I'm not going to do that because this isn't worth it. And that's fine, whatever. But I just wish that they would have said, you know what? It would be way too complex for us to offer this to you. We're sorry. We don't want to take that risk. But we promise that with the next console, we will uh, make it possible to do this in a way that's not going to screw you over. Yeah, I just wish that they would, like, figure out what games are going to be affected and just put out a list. Because I think saying, oh, some games, like, because if it's a bunch of games that I don't fucking care about, who cares? And then, like, the the narrative around this would be totally different. It wouldn't be, oh, look at all these fucking bullshit caveats. I'd be like, ah, well, whatever. This is going to affect, like, a small number of people who are still playing some old fucking game or whatever. Like, I'm sure it's not going to be that big a deal. But it just, it just, after all this time, from them to be like, we finally have a solution for you. And it's messy as hell. It's just like, come on. You know, like, just get it together. Yeah, honestly, yeah, say, saying that you can do it. But all these problems in between makes me just feel but, like but 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 <laughs> you shouldn't have like offered the service at all. You know, like uh, see that's where I disagree because I still am glad because I don't I don't <laughs> want my PSN ID to be well. You have the one you want, so you're fine. It's not even I that. I rebranded it's just, like I, fucking four years ago, he, and I still have a name I can't fucking stand. <laughs> it doesn't make me hopeful for any other service when I hear that they can't let you change your name easily. That that like, I, yeah, it's built on the bones of the other system and all that, but it like, you know, when it's this shoddy, I, I'm I don't know. Like, who the hell knows what their next update that 6.10 or whatever um, you know, is, is, is if it's trying to integrate this, it's like, who knows what it's going to do for people who don't change it. Maybe it's going to have a bug that goes backwards. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't sound like they have, like Andy said before, like, they don't have the shit together, you know? It, I'm curious to know what's going on. Like, I don't know. Just doesn't sit well, I guess. The fact that you could lose access to, you know, paid paid content is enough for me. That's insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, a bad look. That and the money, the currency you have possibly, you know, losing, like, those two are red flags for me. So... Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't make my faith in in the system stronger, I would say. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we'll update you on this one as it develops uh and undoubtedly gets worse or something. <laughs> so, uh, moving right moving right along, uh there was another update over on the PlayStation blog this week because Marvel's Spider-Man has released its first piece of DLC, The Heist which is the Black Cat story, uh, which, you know, was supposed to be out by now, actually, but had a, a small pushback, but um, we, we finally got it. So we got a, uh, a, a post on the, the PlayStation blog from Ryan Smith, who's the game director over at Insomniac Games. And, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just read a little bit from his, uh, his message here. So the opening paragraph is him just kind of being like, oh, it's so great that it was such a success and everyone's getting the platinum trophies and stuff and having fun, new game plus, blah, 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 blah. So here's what we got for the announcement. To add on to the ongoing excitement, today we launched our first chapter of DLC in Marvel Spider-Man, The City That Never Sleeps, Marvel Spider-Man The Heist. This chapter includes new missions, enemies, suits, and of course, a new story starring none other than Black Cat herself. While investigating the robbery of a New York art mu- art museum, Spider-Man and Mary Jane Watson find themselves closing in on c- criminal supervillain Felicia Hardy, a.k.a. Black Cat. The chase will take Spidey and MJ deep into Manhattan's shadowy world of crime families. Uh, players will be able to unlock three new suits, including a new original resilient suit designed exclusively for Marvel Spider-Man by famed Marvel illustrator Gabriel Del, Del Otto. Ooh, Del Otto. Oh, he's one of the best is ever. It, is it Del Otto? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then uh, you'll also be able to discover new collectibles and earn trophies from challenges. Uh, one of my favorite favorite parts of the game is J. Jonah Jameson's Just the Facts in-game podcast. I crack a smile every time one of his episodes come up, comes on while I'm swinging through the city, and for some reason I never get tired of his ranting. He's back at it again in Marvel Spider-Man The Heist, and we've got a new video that captures what's happening in the city during Spider-Man's search for the feline felon. Check it out. So there's a trailer you can go check out if you're interested in that. Um, and if you didn't know, if, or if you didn't get the season pass, it's available uh, individually for $9.99, or you can pick up the whole season pass for 25 bucks. Uh, but if you were like me and you got the deluxe edition of the game, uh, you've already got it. So make sure you go download that and, uh, give it a shot. I don't know when I'm going to get to this, honestly, cause I really want to play it, but I got to play some Red Dead. So I don't know. Hopefully I'll have some impressions for you guys next week or something. Maybe Thompson and I'll, and I'll do a pals play or something. We'll figure it out, but I definitely will have thoughts on this when, uh, when I get around to it. Sean, 
How close are you to actually picking up Spider-Man again? Not really close at all, sadly. God damn it. Um, God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> yeah. Don't get your hooks up. <laughs> yeah, no, he'll never play it. It's over. Play it one day. <laughs> one day. <laughs> I believe in you, Sean. He, Thanks, man. He did put it in his PlayStation 4, so that's farther I, than he gets I with a lot of games. I did play it. I just, you know, <laughs> it's tough, man. I got to stop playing World of Warcraft. Yeah, you do. <laughs> All right. So uh, the last little bit here is one that I know that I'm probably the only one who's interested, so I'll keep it short. But um, we talked a few months ago about how Medieval, which was a PlayStation 1 classic, is getting a, uh, a re-release basically over on the PS4. But uh, we finally got word from uh, Sony Worldwide Studios chairman Sean Layden that it is actually a proper remake, not just a remaster. So uh, when he was over on the PlayStation blogcast uh, last week, Layden explained their, you know, approach to the game more or less. So here's the quote. I think there have been some words that might sound alike but mean different things, like remake and remaster. This is a remake. We've taken the original game design and we've taken a lot of the key art, some of the other attributes of the game design and ethos, if you will. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I read that with a weird... Inflection. It's hard to read when people are just talking. Uh, we've taken the original game design and we've taken a lot of the key art, some of the other attributes of the game design and ethos, if you will. Uh, and we're working with a developer called Other Ocean Interactive, and they are remaking Medieval in that design. The original Medieval from PS1, the one that I worked on when I was in Tokyo. So that's really cool. Uh, I, I was a really big fan of Medieval when I was a kid. And uh, he said that a lot of the original talent from the game is returning and, uh, like, kind of making sure that the original tent intent of the creators is, like, shining through and everything like that, which is just cool. I'm, I'm a big fan of this as a development um, in games. Like, I, I'm a fan of remasters and collections and all that stuff, but I think particularly with, like, the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2 era of games that don't age particularly well, I really like when they do this kind of, like, crash, you know, remastered approach where let's take it from the ground up, keep the original intent, but make it the way you remember it, not the way that it really is. Because a lot of those games, the control schemes don't translate well because it was on a D-pad, or the graphics are muddy, and all these problems, but a lot of the core mechanics and ideas were still good. You know, and seeing how well that worked with Crash and Spyro, I'm excited for Medieval. So I never played Medieval, because I didn't have a PlayStation. But, like, was it one of those games that asked you to navigate 3D space with a D-pad? Yeah. Oh, yeah, then this is, like, not just good, but maybe necessary. Yeah. And like, I, like, I'm really happy that you're happy about it. I'm, I'm excited, and I, I'm interested to see how it does, because I don't yeah. feel like there's a ton of people that love it as much as I do, but I don't know, man. It's just, like, I guess less people played it, because I had a PlayStation. I didn't play it, um, nothing on the game. I just never got to it or never thought of it. Yeah, I played the first one and the second one and was very into There's them. two. And yeah. I never even <laughs> And I, oh, I think boy. I think the second one actually had analog support. But the first one didn't, if memory serves. Um if somebody wants to fact check me on that one, you can hit us up and I'll shout you out on the next episode. Um, I played I played the first one on a demo. You guys remember those old demos? Oh discs? hell yeah. Oh I love those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh I kinda liked it, but I didn't like it enough to ever want to buy it. I, I just uh, I don't know, it passed me by. That was what I did. I played the demo and was like, oh, this is awesome. You can pull off your arm and use it as a weapon and there's puzzles and ah, I love this. And I went and got it. There was something about it. It was creepy, you know, like it was it was it had a very unique vibe among PlayStation one games that were like kid friendly, you know, because it was still like a mascot kind of game and like it had platforming and stuff. But it was definitely a little bit more like Zelda, a little bit more like Metroidvania kind of style, you know, where there was. A little bit more exploration, a little bit more, you know, more than just jumping and fighting. Hmm. And I like but that. But do you really it. need more in a game than jumping and fighting? You don't. That's, that's the two fundamental pillars of video games. That's just true. Man. <laughs> jump and shoot. Jump and shoot, man. <laughs> it's jump and swing your arm around like a sword, man. That's what That's what we got here. Sir oh. Daniel. That's his name. <laughs> mm, so I'm like excited for this one. Uh, yeah, I, I, Thompson, I think you're going to like Medieval when we play it. I think you are. 
I think it's gonna. I what think it's a Thompson playing? game. <laughs> I like. I like you jumped the gun on that one like really early. I mean, it's not even out. It's just like it's it's getting this proper remake, and it, like, we're, we're already playing. <laughs> Let's be real. I I produce pals play because what games we play is almost entirely dependent on which games I buy, and I'm buying yeah. this. So well, we're we playing. Can ha- access my uh, Steam library if you want. I mean, <laughs> what they put games on computers? Gross. I've got like only 300 games. We could pick between them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I share my Steam library with you too, Pete. You got <laughs> I so play, much options. I play your games privately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't we don't get to play the real meaty ones on the show because it's unfortunately the fact that like they would you know kill people if they had to see what I do in like Victoria too, and you you just you you'll, you'll melt down. It's, it's not it's not good for a show. <laughs> All right, so moving right along, uh, it seems like Intellivision is ready to give Atari a run for its money by returning to the console space in 2020 with a new device called the Amico. Uh, so this is this is just weird. This is weird news, but this is we're 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 jumping in here. So Polygon's Charlie Hall did a little write up on it um, that I thought was interesting, but uh, his kind of tagline I think outlines a lot of the major bullet points to touch on here which is every game is said to be exclusive to the platform costs less than eight dollars and will have no DLC or in-app purchases that's their elevator pitch here uh, so I don't know if you guys got a chance to take a look at this but if not uh, I would just open up the article that I have attached in our notes and just check out the like trailer and stuff it's uh very retro looking for sure but the the whole look of it it's like so the trailer is very retro but the amico looks like it looks like something that people would like think of as a futuristic device like, like in the 80s like this looks like a yeah. a, a, a game console like from like back to the future stuck in a foot massager <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is yeah, accurate. That's actually really Really good, man. It looks it looks more like a foot bath than uh, I'm granted. This is their preliminary conceptual design, but I'm just, it, it's it's interesting. Uh, and, and the trailer promises a lot of things. It's got 21st century architecture because it has an HDMI cable and multiple HD ports. It can do Wi-Fi. You guys, it has interactive lighting. It's like. Ugh. Wireless control. I don't know. It's weird. It's fucking weird. It's just, like Atari, you know, comes out and they say they're making this stupid box thing, and then the whole world has like a split timeline now where every jackass thinks they can just come back and do something. Listen. And then we get this. What's next? The <laughs> Vision is going to come back, and then Commodore is going to be cool Listen, again. I'm not saying it's oh going to be God. good, but it, according to this Polygon article, it is going to launch with bad dudes. So, are you cool. a bad enough dude to rescue the president? The thing is. From ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> this this is the timeline where memes are reality. Like this is crazy. It, it is it is funny because like looking at it, um, the controllers, like the iPod looking things, like they look a lot like the classic Coleco controllers. Like it definitely seems like they're trying yeah, they to stay do. true to the the legacy of Coleco. I just don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but uh, there's some other interesting things. Like they said, you can apparently there's an app you can download to turn cell phones into additional controllers for certain games. Um, like they said, all games are console exclusive, but that doesn't make sense because a lot of the games that they mentioned are not like Bad Dudes is not console exclusive. That is available on the NES. Um, so I don't know about that, but <laughs> they they plan promise a lot of other things like. Uh, tournament modes and rewards like trophies and achievements or whatever they said the price point is going to be between 150 and 179 dollars uh they're reimagining a bunch of their game licenses uh all kinds of stuff they're remaking a bunch of the intellivision classics atari classics are going to be coming back um and and like andy said they they mentioned a bunch of different games they talk about the team and who's here working on it so go check it out if you're interested in this um there there's a huge list of like in television and atari titles that like and like and magic and some other random old school retro stuff but nothing else that is like new or, or mentioning like any of that kind of stuff so it's it's interesting to me that they're claiming that these are you know, uh, console exclusive. I guess maybe they mean the reimagined versions of them are, but uh, the Polygon article counts, c- calls out uh, Astro Smash, Snafu, Tron, Deadly Discs, and Star Strikes uh, as being some of the launch lineup of like the reimagined games. So 
I don't know. What do you guys think about this? First of all, okay. This trailer is trying so hard to be like hip in 2018. (laughs) But it really feels like 2004. And that's very weird. Uh, Second of all, listen. All due respect to all these people who are involved. I don't need to see the the profile of the people who are making it. <laughs> this isn't a dating website. I don't need to know who the like one of these guys one of these guys has his profile says skills. Video game historian. Last I checked, that's not a skill. What what like what what are you what are you putting in here? This is ridiculous. Uh um and then as, as far as these games, like listen, our type is kind of alright. But I don't need to buy a one hundred and fifty dollars system to play that. Yeah, a lot of the Coleco games are not very good. You know, like they're important if you're learning about video game history. They they did a lot, but like you play a ColecoVision, those remote control controllers are something else, man. This is just shri- who's t- the target? Hey. Who? I think this is. I, for I, people, like, I really like, want to know. Like this ain't for you, me. You know what? You I know what, be- uh, Sean? I actually. Okay. Wait, wait, Andy. Like, I, I, have a, I just have a joke. I have a joke. Let me just. I know who exactly for this is for Tom. Okay, one more time, Sean. Sorry. <laughs> I know exactly who this is for. All right. Uh, they said we are creating a console that parents want to buy, not that they were asked to buy. That comes from right, right from their mouth, man. So obviously oh. we're, we're we're appealing to All parents right. who don't have a modern game console and they want to play the old crappy games they remember I when they were a kid that's like honestly <laughs> exactly right like this is for people 10 15 years older than us who you know maybe didn't have a super or like a nintendo because the, it was before their time but they like you know they yeah. missed their in television from when they were a kid yeah listen, listen my dad uh, you know, when I was born, was was playing some Atari and shit, and and, and had all those systems. And back then, it was expensive, and we didn't, you know, we, you know, there was a luxury that my my parents had. My dad has no interest in this or the Atari box. I think it's hilarious that like if that's their market. It's like my dad's actually like a, an old school gamer, and he's like, no nah, man, shit today is so much better. I want to play like that, crap, you know. The, it, you know it was it, I'm saying in the video it says. <laughs> I wanted to laugh out loud, but we're recording this show, so I don't want to laugh while people's talking. It says, all games are rated E for everyone or E10+. plus. Why is that a part of your promo? Why is that cool? <laughs> it's like, family friendly, that's not Sean. Cool. But isn't that like the Nintendo's gimmick? You know, where they're just like, hey, we're family friendly. No, because friendly they also have. Ev- there's no, fucking Doom and Bayonetta and like. Say if you <laughs> yeah, be. but like. Yeah, no, I'm saying they have like, you know, the Mario parties and but, all that, you know. They, but they I think can... Sean's point is that when you're elevator pitch, one of the things like, all the games are rated E. It's like, okay, yeah. so? Like. <laughs> right, right. It's. It's me. Are they it's fun? Me. That's but, the yeah, question. I don't know. Yeah, I don't care what they're rated. Are they good games? And the game they didn't showcase one. Like, I mean, maybe they did. I don't, I don't know, but I don't think they showcased one new game. Mm-mm. And nothing that I saw was like cool. I mean, these games were hot in like the nineteen forties. I don't know. <laughs> come on, man. You, you can't, you can't, come on, man. One hundred and fifty dollars. You know what kind of cool shit I could get with one hundred and fifty dollars in twenty eighteen? I can, I can get something that's gonna do virtual reality. Okay. I don't need to spend $150 to play our type. Yeah, especially you there could you spend go. $150 <laughs> to build a uh what do they call them? The little um the Linux boxes. I forget what there's like a name for them. Yeah. But the modular computers, you could buy one and make an emulator and put all these fucking games on it. <laughs> I could get listen, it's illegal to do, but I could get an emulator for free right now and play every single one of these games. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I yeah. I've played this. I'm done with it. That's all. Well, here's <laughs> here's the thing, Sean. So that quote I read earlier was from the the, the leadership team who's led by their CEO and Tommy video game musician, Tommy Tallarico. <laughs> and uh, and here's here's what he had to say. So you know, save it, Sean, with your your hot takes. Listen to Mr. Tallarico. 
<laughs> Most every game being made for the home consoles these days is created with only the hardcore gamer in mind. We see a world where everyone is interested in playing at home and with friends, but this isn't currently possible because the barrier to entry is nearly impossible for a non-gamer due to the complexity of the controllers, intricacy of gameplay, expense of hardware and software, and st steep learning curve with an unbalanced fun factor for the beginner. Our goal was to create a console that both gamers and non-gamers are able to have fun with and play together. The Intellivision Amico is our answer to this gaping hole we see within the current video game industry. Come, like, come on, brother. All right, do you know who fills okay. that gaping <laughs> hole? The Nintendo motherfucking Switch. Don't even. So, games are too inaccessible. So the idea, the solution, is to go back to what we were doing in 1925 with video <laughs> games. Just Back in 1850. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's just like your point is like that's such a – that's like if you know anything about retro games, you know that's not true. Most – especially really old games are way fucking harder because they're not intuitive yeah. and because the controllers suck. They don't even and, tell and, you how to play. <laughs> and the stupid Intellivision controller thing is – Part of the uh, problem, which made those incredibly hard to play. <laughs> yeah. This oh, looks like God. a DJ setup. This is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally like the two iPods and a foot bath approach, but. So here's the thing, guys. Much like the Atari box, I am signing us up for their email list. Because I have such a morbid no! curiosity in this. This 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 story is not gonna die. And I wanna see what fucking happens. Oh my God. So uh Pete, this story would die if you let it. I can't. I can't let People it. People like you are part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not giving You're her my money. You're literally giving them a platform. Yeah, I am. <laughs> but like, also just so we can roast them a little bit. I mean, I feel like it's totally fair. If it's a success, I'll eat my words just like I did with Venom. It's fine. But otherwise, I'm sticking with it. it looks like a DJ foot bath. All right, so moving along into our meat and potatoes, uh, we had a little interview with uh, one of the Hauser brothers over at GQ that uh, I thought was a little, I thought it was pretty interesting. So, and I think it's 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 a nice little jumping off point for a conversation I'd like to have. So during uh, the the interview, he was saying that he doesn't know that a game like GTA Six would um, would work in 2018 because of our our current political climate and uh, his his fear that um that the the by its very nature how offensive GTA is would make it a little too polarizing. So um here's what he had to say. It's really unclear what we would even do with it, let alone how upset people would get with whatever we did. Both intense liberal progression and intense conservatism are both very militant and very angry. And it is scary, but it is also strange, and yet both of them seem occasionally to veer towards the absurd. It's hard to satirize for those reasons. Some of the stuff you see is straightforwardly beyond satire. It would be out of date within two minutes. Everything is changing so fast. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that that means that there isn't going to be a uh, a GTA 6, right? I think GTA is too valuable of a of a franchise to leave behind. But uh what do you guys think about what Dan Hauser had to say here? You know, like do you think that 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 tracks? Like I I remember how much um controversy there was around GTA 5 even with some of the subject matter and the stories like torture and stuff like that and the way that it lampooned some of modern culture that didn't really seem to sit right with people. And I wonder, in the age of, of Twitter war and all that kind of stuff, and Donald Trump and all this shit, like, how does that, where does GTA 6 fit in that? Do you think it does? I, like, if my eyes were screws, they'd have rolled out of my head. <laughs> uh, because whenever somebody wants to complain about the modern culture and, like, I don't know if, like, this would work in modern culture, because, you know, people just are so militant now. I I think about Anthony Jeselnik, who is a comedian that's, like, built a name out of really dark humor that, like, borders on the offensive. And he's been pretty open about, like, no, it's not, like, it's not the culture that changes. Just try harder. Like, it's not hard to not be offensive. And honestly, I think, like, yeah, the... The GTA 5 torture stuff was not a great look, but that also wasn't really satire. It was just like Trevor tortures. Yeah, and it, it was like, 
I feel like it was kind of supposed to be like a jab at like, you know, like uh, the fact that like there are lots of American, you know, like places where we commit torture and stuff like that. But it didn't feel like it was really it, it felt like it was like, oh, right. Like we're saying something, aren't we? And it's like, are you, though? Like this kind of just feels like an uncomfortable scene. Right. Either or, man, if you felt it was uncomfortable or it was saying something, it still led to Trevor being this psychopath who tortures people. And, and for storytelling purposes alone, it fit for his character and for the narrative at that moment, you know? And if it's just because it's a GTA game, they're saying, you know, maybe they're not saying anything, but they're not afraid to show what they wanted to show for that. And it just led to, you know, the greater picture, honestly. I know it's like a controversial scene, but I mean, you can't you can't like have half that game exist without talking about something at least that someone's going to be offended about, like multitudes of stuff that I can't even think about. That there's there's going to be people's life experiences that cross over into things in those games that are not going to sit well with people, you know. Yeah. So, well, drawing the line at like a torture scene, I think for them, you know wasn't too hard of a decision. Well, I honestly. think a lot of people also raise the point of like, well, maybe the, maybe the scene exists to put a mirror up to what you're doing, right? That the entire game is you being a terrible person yeah. and killing people and murdering and maiming people and stealing and you know, doing all these horrible things and you revel in them and you don't think about them. But then this thing, when they slowed it down and they make you torture an innocent man, do you still feel good? You know? And like, I don't know. It's, it could be that, it's yeah. It's interesting. And that's art, man. It's got multiple perspectives on yeah. it, you know? And that's what makes it so, like, you know, so much more than just a game, you know? It's it's like... I strong disagree. <laughs> I think Grand Theft Auto V is one of the most overrated games I've ever played. Um, Damn. I also, like, I don't know. I I don't think that it's, like, a bad thing that, like, Grand Theft Auto is being asked to change. I definitely do. Um, I I agree with everything that Hauser said, except for the part where he said that it wouldn't work in modern society because um, Grand Theft Auto has always been the out the outlier in terms of what they were allowing themselves to do, um, and there's always been hate surrounding it, but it's always sold amazingly well, and that's not going to change because a lot of gamers don't give a shit about the PC stuff; they don't care. And they're going to play it anyways. Uh, so the group of people that he's referencing are not the group of people who are buying Grand Theft Auto no matter what they do in the game. Or they are uh, and they don't so, care. You know, to your point. Because how many yeah, people whatever. bought Grand Theft Auto? I think there are a lot of people that have, you know, um, like like very liberal leaning sensibilities that still played and enjoyed that game and weren't offended by it. You know? Yo. <laughs> oh yeah, I still played and enjoyed that game and wasn't like really Me offended too. by it, but... Like, I also don't think it's, like, some triumph of storytelling. No, no, I don't think so but either. It, does, it doesn't matter. Oh, no. No, I think that, like, the the way the Grand Theft Auto series has always, like, been held up as, like, stories in video games. I think a Grand Theft Auto story worked twice in uh, San Andreas and 4. And I think those were the most grounded, like, not big satire stories. Yeah, that's true. Grand, the Grand Theft Auto 4 is way more emotional. Yeah, it's just like a really sad rumination on the American dream. And, like, that's cool. And San Andreas was, like, a really personal story about, you know, growing up in L.A. in the early 90s. And that was cool, too. Andy, to that first thing, I always thought that Five's story was the continuation in a way of Four. Like, this is kind of what the American dream did to people. Like, all, you know different facets of life looking at it and that's why i liked fives as i didn't think it was like in a, like the best story like the present presentation can be a lot better in some things but the over exaggeration of it all the streams that everyone goes to just because they're like well this is what i do yeah it was, it was about like the um, excess of of la yeah i always thought it was interesting and like it made me respect four a lot more because of that um but i because I thought that they played on each other. I, I want to let Sean get back in here because we got to wait. We jumped off one of his points and then got down a rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sean. That's okay. Uh, the thing is that it shouldn't matter whether or not anyone thinks that, that the story of Grand Theft Auto is relevatory. And it shouldn't matter whether anyone thinks that a scene in the game is offensive because things are going to be offensive in life. And it is what it is. And if you can't handle that, don't buy the game. The game shouldn't change for you. You should just not buy it because there are people who like that. 
And that's just the way it is. Um, and I feel the same way about many, 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 many facets of our existence. Uh, but just to keep it to the, to, to Grand Theft Auto, uh, Grand Theft Auto has always existed in that space of being the game that's not afraid to offend. And it's always been a game franchise that I respected because of that. And I think a lot of people feel the same way, whether it's satire or not. And it often is. Um, the fact of the matter is that when everyone else is shying away from doing certain things because of the way the culture has changed, uh, they lean in. And I appreciate that because there is a segment of, 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 of the audience, uh, that is tired of seeing that, that is tired of seeing, uh, not just in games, but everywhere else, the, you know, well, we can't do this or say this anymore because it will offend people. Ah, screw that. Let's have fun. Let's let's stop worrying so much about what's offensive and just have a good time. Grand Theft Auto uh, is not going to cause me to go out and torture someone just because a character in the game did it. And I'm not uncomfortable with that. And if you are uncomfortable with that, then instead of complaining about it existing, just go play what you enjoy. That's not going to make you feel that way if you can't handle being uncomfortable. Yeah, speak with your wallet. <clears throat> um, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think... I don't think speaking with your voice is bad either, though. Like, I'm not saying it shouldn't be allowed to exist. I'm saying I don't like that it existed. But, like, if you did, good for you. Well, I'm not, like, saying, you know, you're a bad person for playing this. I'm saying this was an artistic choice that made me uncomfortable. Yeah, you. I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying you can't say that. I'm saying you said, you specifically said you don't think it's a bad thing if GTA is being asked to change. I'm saying that that yeah. is a bad thing. Because that's saying, well, there's a certain segment of the audience that is offended by this, so you should stop making it that way. That's yeah, not I, cool for me. I I think that's just how things work. I'm not saying they have to change. I'm saying that's a decision that, like, maybe, you know, they just think about it more. I'm not saying that them changing would definitely be good or bad. I'm saying that, like... Uh, just having the conversation is in and that, of like itself being valuable. asked to think about those things is valuable. Yeah, being asked to think about those things, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But like having the conversation and thinking about it and getting that perspective, rather than just saying like, "Well, I don't know," the culture won't let us do what yeah, we want. That's th- I'd like to take it back to that quote for a second because I think I think we're getting a little. Um, not off the rails, but away from that, which it, and I think we're arguing more about like kind of. I guess some of the core values of GTA and, and that's, I guess what I, I, I land a little bit more on Andy's side of the the fence in terms of just reacting to Dan's statement where he's saying that, ah, I don't think it could work in this day and age because of how people are. I don't really think that's true. Um, I think it might be more of a lightning rod, but I think to, to your point, Sean, uh, GTA has always been, or I, I should say the team behind GTA, I guess have always been provocateurs, you know? The, yeah, we, we already talked about that. I already said I, I disagree with that, that that point was dumb. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. And I was just going to say, I just wanted to make a point on that where, like, I think I think it's honestly a better time than ever for GTA because of that. Because I think, like, the way that GTA at its best takes a mirror and holds it up to our society and, and makes you cringe at the things that are uncomfortable and laugh at the things that are absurd, um, I think would be really potentially valuable in this time, you know? And, and I think his point about that there are some things that are so absurd that it would be hard to lampoon, that might be true. Um, the creators of South Park certainly expressed that. Uh, but I think I think that is when you need parody the most, is when, like, there is a real problem in society and when there is uh, a negative power to be spoken to. You know, and I don't know how GTA does that or if GTA is even the right property to do that. But I think uh, to Andy's point, um, if if they do go into it with that mindset of, well, things are a little bit more sensitive than they were when we made GTA 5. So we need to think about what's the way to do that level of satire in 2018 so that it's the most effective. I that could That's a game I might be really interested in. I'm just arguing against the idea that it should be less offensive. Yeah, I don't. That's what I, I don't. Think. I don't think it needs to be less offensive. I think it needs to be thoughtful in the ways in which it is offensive. 
But you assume that that torture scene wasn't thoughtful. Uh, no, I didn't. I, I said, like, I don't know that it is, but I think that there are plenty of ways you can interpret it and say that it might be. You know, like I said, it's it's rumination on, like, you not having a problem with violence until it has a face to it. You know? You don't mind killing random NPCs, but when this guy has a voice and a name, that makes you feel uncomfortable. Maybe that is... Maybe that was their intention, right? Like... I, I'm not saying that there's uh, no room to be made uncomfortable or to be offended or any of those things. I think a lot of times those things are valuable. I think it's to his point, though, like the climate has changed. And I think the way you have to do that, the, the needle might have moved a little bit, you know, or the targets moved a little. Maybe I, I, I disagree with that because I feel like, again, um, you know, people need to just get over it. It's just if you if you can't handle it, don't buy the game. I don't want. I don't. What I don't want is for the Housers and the writers of the game and the whole creative team to sit and go, well, we want to do this scene and we feel really strongly about it, but we're worried that it might bother some people. So we're either going to tone it down or not do it at all. I, I never, you never want to hear that creative people are having that conversation with themselves and giving us something less than what they intended for us to receive because they're worried that people are going to be offended. Yeah, you don't want you don't because want them to sand down the, the edges. Vision. Yeah. What do you think about this, Thompson? Well, um I personally think that everything that they do is perfectly acceptable and I revel in it because it's like playing Doom is a good example. It's over the top on purpose. A lot of GTA stuff, uh like I don't write home about the story, but I enjoy. It. I liked Trevor's parts the most actually. You know, I thought his was the coolest one just because, like, it puts you in the eyes of the psychopath and you got your, your missions are just do crazy shit. Like, you know, it, it doesn't for a normal person. You're sitting there. This is insane. You know, why am I doing this? Well, you're trying to play the crazy guy. Um, I think for them saying it not working in this climate today, uh, it'll work in any climate, man. Uh, that's kind of the point of it. And I mean, I, I see that at least, um, you know. The way that you have Trevor as a character, you could you could lean into either side or both at the same time. Um, you know what he mentioned, uh, militant left and right. Uh, yeah, make that the two main characters. You know what I mean? Like that that gives you a perspective on both sides. Like what what is causing people um, to be uncomfortable in that era? You know, if the if that has moved, you know, you address that. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility to make a game that could do what we're doing now. You know, like politically and, and make it easily digestible and maybe it'll be, seem like less of a satire but it's still obviously going to be a satire because it's a video game you know what i mean and it's a gta game at that like i, I don't expect for one moment that the shit that i did in five was feasible you know what i mean like the amount of gunfights you can get into without dying and stuff you know it's already broken the realm of immersion for me so you know, it's like it's for me. It's like playing Just Cause, where they're like, "What if we took that to the nth degree?" And you can everything you can grapple hook to a helicopter and sling that to a car. You know what I mean? Just really crazy shit you can do in that game. Um, GTA is one step below that, obviously. So you know, or like even Saints Row, they take it to the nth degree again. Um, so, I, but I like, but I like GTA for like this the pseudo realism they give me. You know, and having the torture scene in there and shit like that, it always brings you back to me, at least for me, stuff like. You know, I was having a great time blasting guns and doing like crazy action shit. And all of a sudden there's this scene and it's a change of pace that I didn't expect. You know what I mean? And I'd heard about it, but it wasn't like it shocked me or anything. Like, didn't like, you know, it was just one of those things. Like, I thought that was interesting. Middle of uh, the two scenes that are happening, you're you're shooting with the other guy and defending the spot. And then it cuts over to that and you're getting information and you're, you're coordinating. And I thought for like gameplay, that was really cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the way they worked it into yeah, that. Yeah. I remember thinking it was interesting because I, I had actually started feeling uncomfortable a little bit in GTA 5 because I felt like they were um, because of the whole subplot with Trevor and like the older woman that he ends up falling in love with. I remember I, I felt like yeah. they were humanizing him too much and I was like, this is like a sick person like I don't want to feel empathy for him and then he tortures a man and I was like, but, oh okay yeah, no they remember yeah, he's a yeah. piece of shit sociopath like <laughs> right and, but that's, the, you know, they I mean like it's that's like abusive, you know you know, cult stuff at its finest, you know, like he indoctrinated the old lady to even like him. You know what I mean? It was, it was, it was wild for me to, to see that, that they had seen all facets of it. Cause you know, he obviously had like minions in his life and he was doing that to her too. You know what I mean? And it's like, he says he loved her and stuff and like, he didn't like kill her. I mean, but okay. Like he's Trevor, you know what I mean? Uh, he, so I thought that fit 
really well with it. Like the pseudo humanization of it, like the longer you see it, you become desensitized to the shit he does anyway. And you start seeing it as less of a thing, you know? And, um, I don't know, just his, his absolute challenge to everything that exists, you know, like every single system is fucked and he needs to be the opposite of it almost. Uh, I thought was in, just crazy for of a game to see how far you could go before. It yeah. You know, it was like a, it was like a breaking bad kind of shit, sure. you know, for me. Oh, see, I had a just completely different read on Trevor hmm. and it's a, a big part of the reason I bounced off gta 5 like story-wise as much as i did because like i still played the whole game it was fun to play but like i throughout the whole game i felt like the game was saying yeah but look how cool trevor is oh really i always thought they were trying to say look at how crazy he is like like look at how crazy he is and look at how cool and entertaining see that was my thing is i always felt like they wanted Mm. you to feel that way and then they would show you his true colors and make you feel bad about feeling that way at least that was my reaction to it and it was often like effective because i didn't like trevor at all um i i thought he was an interesting character to follow but he was the character that like i you know like like michael is a piece of shit but in some ways i feel sympathy for him you know because he's such a sad sack motherfucker and like franklin was a character that absolutely i thought was likable and empathetic whereas like trevor i i looked at as like a monster yeah, I don't think that it was effective for me in the, like, make you feel bad yeah, about Trevor yeah. stuff. It was like, Trevor's a monster, sure, but, like, you have to be a monster to be as cool as Trevor is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, and I can see that, and I can see how people would take that reading away from it as well. Um, so it's interesting, though. Um, oh, I was, I was very disappointed at the ending choices where I was only able to have one of Franklin or Michael or sorry, have Franklin let one of Michael or Trevor die or save both of them. Cause like if I could have had both Michael and Trevor die at the end of GTA five. <laughs> wow. So that's hate from Michael. I mean, yeah, I agree with everything Pete said, but I never thought the man deserved to die for it. Oh, know? he did. <laughs> and it just gets he stitches, did. man. Uh, so I don't know, man. I, I think to, to put a bow on this conversation, um, I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with Dan. You know, I, I think I think there's plenty of room for a GTA six in, in our current climate. There's always room. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it might be more challenging than it was with GTA five. I, I wouldn't take that away from him, but it was challenging when they did it in GTA three. We hadn't seen a game like that before and it pushed the envelope and, and it got them a lot of heat. And yeah, I think as long as they're you remind me, Vice City comes out a game out of its time and it works different you know entirely different era that they want to encapsulate he doesn't have to even be modern day if they want that's a great point too and i i think another thing that i saw circling around was that they had apparently considered doing a version that was like in uh in tokyo or something like that like they had the um they had like the one that was in Europe? like england back on the, the that was like the first spinoff it was like uh london nights or whatever yeah yeah so I, maybe if they're really that concerned about it take it somewhere else you know i don't know I, I, but I feel like the GTA formula can easily work at any point, you know? Um, and I, I definitely agree with, uh, with what Sean said in, in terms of, I don't want to see it lose its edge. I just want to see it continue to evolve and, um, be thoughtful about how it is, uh, is using its satire. Because I think it, more so than my fear that it, um, is going to be too offensive. I'm more afraid of it becoming stale because I think uh, that's something you've seen a lot of people. I, I brought up South Park before. That's something you see a lot of people accuse it of is that it was counterculture and now it's just culture. How can the most successful, highest selling video game franchise of all time re- re- keep that edge, keep that attitude? I think that's the real challenge that they have moving into GTA 6 more so than people's reactions to it. That's my, my personal takeaway. Yeah, I like... I don't know. I, I still am not crazy about the idea that, like, asking them to be more thoughtful, like, engenders staleness. I don't... I, that's not what I'm saying. Like, I don't think that... Oh, no, no, no. I'm not I'm not oh. saying you're saying that. But th- that's, that's the attitude that, like, I kind of get from this. Like, I don't know if it would work. And I, like, am not sure if I think that's right. I would love to see, like, Grand Theft Auto 6 come out and be good. And, like, have that thoughtfulness that, like, 
from what I've heard about Red Dead Redemption 2, we know they're capable of. Mm-hmm. Like, you know? Well, yeah, I think Red Dead and Redemption 1's a lot The like first that. Red Dead yeah. Redemption. Even Grand Theft Auto, like, even Grand Theft Auto 4 was a, like, thoughtful game. And it's still offensive. It was, it's it still was, biting. Yeah. It still has that edge. Right. Um, but they're, they're, there's a, there's a interesting meditation there. Um, yeah, I don't know. No matter how, no matter how you dress it up, Grand Theft Auto is always going to be for a lot of people a video game where the core thing is run people over with cars, shoot at cops and kill them, um, steal from people, and have a blast while doing it. And I think um, a lot of people want to dress that up, and that's never going to work because a lot of people just play the game like that. Um, and uh, I don't want to see it move away from that at all. I want to see it embrace what it is, which it always has. And that's a big reason why I respect that franchise so much. That doesn't mean you can't do uh, great storytelling within that framework, but I think they always have, and you guys disagree. So, Yeah, I, th- I think there are there are peaks and valleys when it comes to storytelling in GTA. Just like anything else. Yeah, yeah I agree. Because yeah. I, I would definitely agree that GTA 4 is a great narrative. Um, I really enjoyed San Andreas. I think even Vice City to a degree. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think it, they've done it before and I think them doing it again is, um, a foregone conclusion in my mind. It's just a matter of if, or not when, uh, if, but when and how. I, like, also worry that, that Japan rumor you mentioned, if they end up doing that, I think that might be, like, super duper bad just because, like, the Grand Theft Auto games, since they've been, like, the big Grand Theft Auto games, have always been, like, so deeply intertwined with, like, American mm-hmm. culture. Mm-hmm. And, like, I don't know that, like, the Housers, really just the Housers because they are Rockstar games, like, know Japan well enough to, like, have that kind of insight they do into America, into Japan. Yeah. Like, I feel like it would be missing something. Yeah, I agree with that because I, I, I think the satire in Grand Theft Auto's storytelling is, is one of the more compelling things about it. Uh, often, you know, I think like um, the mm-hmm. shots they took at like social media culture in uh, in Grand Theft Auto Five were really really clever, and um, that's something that you only know by living it, right? And like they are Americans, and and their their perspective is uniquely American, uh, and I think that's even present in Grand uh, in uh, Red Dead Redemption, right? Like it's looking at America's past, but they have a clear perspective on it and can bring a you know an interesting angle to it that. I think I think you're right. Might be lost in another setting. So I don't know. I I think I think ultimately the future is bright for Grand Theft Auto because there's a lot of positive momentum moving out of Grand Theft Auto Five, and it seems like that momentum has continued in Red Dead Redemption too. So I don't really think they have too much to worry about. I think the houses are very talented, and despite their concerns, I think uh, I think when they're ready to give us GTA Six, uh, we'll be ready to play it. Yeah, uh, you know, five, six years from now when they're done with Red Dead Online. And Bully 3! <laughs> <laughs> or 2, rather. Shit. <laughs> Shit, man. And they're going to make two bullies before a new Grand Theft Auto. Let's do it! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so if you guys want to let us know what you think about the future of Grand Theft Auto, let us know in the comments down below. Hit us up at the video game pals at gmail.com. Follow at the comics pals wherever your social media is sold. And let us know what you're thinking. Uh, and remember, if you guys want to help the show out, you can do us a solid by giving us, an ali- giving us a like on your audio platform of choice. Heading over to Apple Podcasts, where we're currently a five-star rated show, and give us one of those sweet, sweet five-star reviews. Uh, or if you're a YouTube person, by clicking the like button, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, and clicking that notification bell so that you know when these daily videos go live. Remember to tune in uh, for our Red Dead Redemption 2 coverage next week, our Castlevania reco- uh, Castlevania Season 2 review, that's a mouthful, next week, and uh, me and Thompson playing some Red Dead Redemption 2 over on Pals Play. Lots of good stuff in the, the weeks to come. So uh, make sure you're tuned for all that stuff. Keep us uh, keep up with us on all those, those ways that I mentioned before, and uh, yeah, check some of that stuff out. Help us out. So before we get out of here, let's do some plug. Thompson? Uh, I'm at Rogue Vampire on Twitter. You can find me doing Pals Play with Pete. Everything you said, we're doing Red Dead Redemption. Sorry, I have to go. Bye, guys. It was See you next show. week, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Tom. Sean. Uh, so you can hear me on the Comics Pals every week. I post the day before this. Uh, this week we had a very long, very, very fun, and very insightful interview with Dirk Manning, uh, who is a comic book writer most famous for stuff like Tales of Mystery. 
and more recently Haunted Ions uh, with the band Twisted. So we had a really good conversation there. And then uh, we also talked about the future of the Netflix Marvel shows and whether or not the Defenders is responsible for the fall of that empire. <laughs> Everybody's uh, getting canceled out there. Yeah, it's uh, it's rough. Uh, and uh, on social media, you can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Soapbox. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about GTA. Why uh, GTA is the shit. Cool, Andy. Cool. Uh, you can find me over on Twitter at Tiger underscore Millions. If you find the picture of John Waters, that's the one. You can talk to me about anything you like. Um, we could talk about GTA, uh, we could talk about Red Dead, except I haven't played Red Dead, so maybe don't, because I don't want to get spoiled. <laughs> but, uh, come talk some Assassin's Creed with me, there you because go. that game's excellent. Awesome. And if you guys want to connect with me, I'm at loud underscore Pete on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, come talk to me about Red Dead Redemption 2 or Daredevil Season 3, which we also did a review of on the Comics Pals this week, which should be available right now. So uh, if you are still trucking along with uh, some of the Netflix stuff, or at least Daredevil, which is obviously the cream of the crop, uh, go check out our review and uh, come hit me up. I'd love to talk about either of them with you. Or if you've gotten your hands on that Spider-Man DLC, should I double back? Should I go do this before I finish up Red Dead? Let me know what's up. All right, so with that, we are the Video Game Pal signing off. We'll catch you on.